Welcome to Empower Humans. I am super excited to bring you this exclusive, exclusive interview with Dr. John Gray and Dr. Warren Farrell, co-authors of The Boy Crisis. These two haven't been interviewed together anywhere else. So listen to the audio podcast, EmpowerHumans.com, or anywhere else you get podcasts. The video version is also available on the Empower Humans YouTube channel. This book is fascinating. This book is powerful. Go out and buy the book. Listen to the audio book, read the book, review the book on Amazon, and then read the book again. We cover a lot of ground in this interview. It's fascinating, and we've only scratched the surface covering topics, everything from the effects of fatherlessness in our society to ADD to parenting to what they call the purpose void and tons of other topics. But again, we only scratched the surface, so you still need the book. Dr. Gray and Dr. Farrell will also be available at the 1440 Multiversity in Santa Cruz, California area on October 26th and through 28th, 2018. If you listen to this anytime after that, look for them at other events, look for other projects these two are involved with. You will not regret spending time with these individuals. And we cover some background of their careers and what led up to this book, The Boy Crisis, and some of their impressive credibility in this industry to be able to put this out there for us. So without further ado, enjoy our interview with Dr. Gray and Dr. Farrell. Dr. Farrell, tell me a little bit about your background. You're from back east, right? Back east, and I was uh, on the my career in male-female issues started when um, I was t I decided to do my doctoral dissertation on male-female issues, and um, the doctoral dissertation committee in my political science department said, uh, "This is just going to be a passing fad, the women's movement." And I said, <laughs> "No, it's going to be an evolutionary shift. You know that men and women, for the first time in history, will have freedom to be able to be." have less rigid roles because they're not so focused on survival. And so this is gonna happen for really, from this point in history on. And so they finally let me go ahead and do that. And uh, that led to my doing my first book on uh, The Liberated Man. And that led me to being involved with the board of directors of the National Organization for Women in New York City and speaking all around the world on women's issues. And I suppose I was sort of the world's leading male feminist, if you will, for many years. <laughs> and then during the 70s, there were a lot of divorces and people began to start, um, the, some of the feminists said, we don't want the fathers to, you know, to be involved with our lives anymore. We want to be able to start new lives with the new stepfathers that will be better than our former, um, you know, than the biological fathers. And we want to be able to move to other areas if we want to. And I said, well, I'm not sure from the little bit of research that we have, it appears that children do a lot better with both mothers and fathers. Mm. And they sort of backed off a little bit from me and said, uh, well, why don't you do some more research on that? And so the part of, a part of me was really wanting to do, to get good information showing that children do much better with mothers than fathers because um, that would have kept me in good graces with now. Um, but I found just the opposite, that um, children do much better when they have about an equal amount of father involvement. And that led to my being open and receptive to what was happening with children after divorce. Yeah. And then as I went around the world and did you know various book tours, um, I kept hearing from like especially teachers in Japan, Australia, et cetera, you know, kids in my class, boys, they're the, they're the ones that are really having the problems. And so that tuned me into boys' issues. And then when John and I met about 12 years ago, um, you know, I was just beginning to do some of my research on, on whether boys really did have a major, major series of issues. And I saw this huge UN study that showed that boys in the 63 largest developed nations, mm -hmm. in fact, were significantly behind girls in all subject areas, especially reading and writing, which are the biggest predictors of success. And then I started looking more carefully about why the 63 most developed nations, and I saw that in those nations, they had a high percentage of divorce and a high percentage of women having children without being married. And in those two groups, there was a huge gap between the children that did not have significant father involvement, mm -hmm. who were doing terribly um, in about 70 different areas, and those that had a lot of father involvement. And that got me started on the boy crisis. Then I met John, and John has obviously an enormous background on male-female issues, and so our energy um, began to catalyze and talk with each other at that point. Okay, okay. A very extensive decades-long background we're talking yes, about here. Yes, absolutely. A lot of uh, 
interaction with various communities and traveling the world and a lot of research. So you, you've had quite the background. I saw too that you, you were invited to the White House in, in your uh, younger days as far as the, uh, uh, your university education yes. time frame. Yes. What was that about? How was that? Well, I was uh, deeply involved with the National Education Association for students. I was their vice president. And, um, and and that was the time that this White House Council on Education was created by President Johnson. That's Lyndon Johnson, not Andrew Johnson. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Thanks for clarifying. In case my age is looking a little bit greater than, <laughs> than, it, than it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, and that led to me, my speaking um, at this White House Council conference on education, and and uh, and that was just a, a wonderful experience. Okay. Okay. Wow. And, and Dr. Gray. We know a great deal about you, or I do at least, uh, as far as uh, some of your background. You're from Texas originally, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Houston, uh, Texas. Houston, okay. Yeah. Down south. See, I grew up in New Mexico for the most part, so we were mm -hmm. kind of neighbors, but not necessarily at the same time. Uh, <laughs> now, I understand, did you come from a family with boys? Yeah, that, there's five, uh, six boys six. and one sister. Okay. Um, and so I have a, a lot of experience of being amongst boys. And then I was a monk for nine years, primarily with men. Uh, and then I got involved in my 30s in intimacy and relationships and so forth. I developed the Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus ideas. Yes, yes. People always ask, how'd you come up with that? Well, certainly as a marriage counselor, so I'm dealing with people's problems every day. But having uh, nine years as a celibate monk, uh, you find yourself, you find a self-love and acceptance of who you are, and when you have a self-love and acceptance of who you are, it's easy to accept and embrace others. And so as a marriage counselor, I was able to help women accept and understand men and help men to accept and understand women. To the extent that we don't really feel good about ourselves, for example, critical of ourselves, then we're going to be critical of others. But the truth is, if we accept that we're not perfect, we're doing our best, then it's easier to accept other people are doing their best even when they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So from that place of a kind of unconditional love for both myself and others, it was easy to, it was a process of developing the major misinterpretations of men and women. So that goes on to developing the ideas that men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, then it moves into having children, uh, I have uh, three daughters and four grandchildren, two boys there. But mainly my experience in working with boys was teaching classes to uh, teens and children. I wrote a book called Children Are From Heaven as well. Mm -hmm. And in working with couples, I found that huge challenges in boys when there was divorce. Uh, just, just what often happens in a variety of ways is you split a boy. I mean, his father is part of him, his mother is part of him. And when they're at war, uh, that war will go on inside of that boy. He'll either deny his masculinity, he'll deny his femininity, because we both have both qualities inside of us. So that was always challenging. And, uh, you know, Warren is brilliant in his understanding of statistics and research showing that truly it bears out that if boys do not have a positive experience with their fathers, they will suffer more. They will have undue challenges in life. And if we can make people aware of that and how they can create a balance, even if they're divorced, what can parents do for their children, it makes a big difference. And you know, one of the things I remember in my Children from Heaven book explaining to mothers that if you get a divorce, just know if you're talking poorly about your partner, that's really going directly to your son. And uh, he'll either feel like uh, I'll never be able to make a woman happy and therefore not make a commitment later in life, but he'll have all other challenges that we talk about in the book. Uh, then I told my women, if, if you're not with a husband, you have to also know with little boys, their deepest desire is always to make mommy happy. <laughs> and we all as adults have adult needs and we have emotional needs, but these adult needs, if a woman is not getting those adult needs met, then a boy will feel like I'm responsible to make mother happy. And uh, certainly your child can make you happy, but that's not their job. Your job is right. to be happy and to have adult relationships. So one of the challenges for mothers sometimes is to think, okay, now I don't have a husband to help raise this child, so I'm gonna have to do double work myself. 
And so she gives up her longing and desire to have an intimate relationship, or she's given up because she's tried it before and it didn't work. And both formulas are a formula for disaster. Mm. So, you know, what I want to do in my work is help women understand how to have positive relationships with the other gender that created that child. You've got, to, you've got to have that positive relationship if you care about your child, and that becomes the motivating factor for her to seek out relationships, have positive relationships, and work on, continue to work on her relationship with the ex, whether it be in present or not, and ideally, as we talk about in the book, to create equal time uh, for the child to be with the father. Mm -hmm. this, these are like such important things, and so what we see is the outcome of this, and in my own personal development, as I reached my 50s, you know, this is um, 10 years after I wrote Men from Mars and teaching it around the world, uh, I had a challenge myself on a health level, which was I had early stage Parkinson's, runs in the family, I've seen what happens when people do the basic medical protocol. Uh, they can reduce symptoms, but the condition gets worse and worse till the medicine doesn't work anymore. And it's not a, not a pretty picture at that point. Mm. So I sought out my abilities to research and found a uh, doctors who were doing natural solutions using amino acids and B vitamins and a variety of things to restore functioning in the brain without having to give a drug, uh, a protocol which really doesn't work over time and it's proven it doesn't work over time. The standard procedure does relieve symptoms, but what we found is that you could halt those symptoms and reverse them in some cases, and at the worst, you can hold them where they are so you don't get worse. Yeah. So when I corrected my own Parkinson's with natural supplements, boom, what I found in retrospect is in my own marriage, while I was working hard to make a great relationship, and my wife and I did have a great relationship, she's passed on now, but it was 33 years of a, a fantastic relationship, and we worked hard at it. But what I found is when I reversed my Parkinson's, it didn't have to work that hard at it. It became much, much easier. And that's because the same symptoms of Parkinson's is actually very similar to ADHD. And as I saw that by, re, re, by healing my Parkinson's, I realized that I had had ADD in the past and no longer had it. Hmm. Uh, the same remedy for Parkinson's, simply put, is a remedy for ADD. It's just some extra supplements and, and it has a profound wow. effect on the brain. Well, as I did that, then I realized massive amounts of research showing that the ADD drugs were actually causing brain damage in children. We didn't know that in the beginning, but it was actually injuring the brain. And we mm -hmm. show the statistics in the book mm -hmm. from several universities and that there's many, many alternatives to using drugs to helping children and how particularly boys who at least are twice as vulnerable to ADD type symptoms as girls and certainly more vulnerable if they don't have the presence of a father figure. Mm -hmm. So this was amazing information and together Warren and I uh, spent a lot of time researching and talking and, and, and exploring and trying out things to write this book, The Boy Crisis. Yes, yes, okay. That's, you know, and, and I wanna get into some of that uh, towards the end too about some of the supplements and the various nutritional aspects of that as well related to dopamine and all the things that we, you went over in the book very very thoroughly I might add anyone who hasn't uh, listened to or read the book get the book and, and I want to mention it's not just a matter of taking uh, some supplements that's a part of it yes, but yes. It's, it's behavioral shifts it's it's focusing your attention on things that that help you to relax as opposed to become overstimulated like <clears throat> singing and, and art and various dancing, and dance exercise. class, exercise, mm -hmm. a whole range of things. But those things help, but then they work much, much better if you're also providing the nutrition the brain needs to rebuild itself. Absolutely. Because that's the stimulation, but you've got to have the fuel. And usually these kids with ADD symptoms are, are craving sugar, eating junk food, uh, having very poor diets, and they can they just like an addiction. So you relieve them of that addiction when you provide the nutrition to make dopamine, the brain chemical pleasure. So they're seeking out pleasurable stimulation because their brain can't make enough of the nutrients to provide pleasure in normal everyday experiences. Right, okay, yeah. John's knowledge and research on ADHD um, is so amazing that we had a birthday party for me once and I had about four people over at the house and John was one of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, my friend, the other friend that came over to the house at the end of the evening, he said, you know, if I didn't know that you had written men are from Mars, women are from Venus, 
I would think that you were one of the world's experts on nutrition and ways, <laughs> and ways of overcoming ADHD. And so when I saw this enormous um, background of knowledge, I had asked John, is there any way that you could do you know, a number of chapters in the book on ADHD prevention? Because um, we all you know, were parents and our kids have ADHD. We all see the enormous anxiety that they're experiencing and it's so tempting to reach to a drug and to sort of solve that problem that is diminishing our son's uh, self-esteem. And so, um, but you know, John says there's so much else you can do that doesn't have to create the stepping stone to addiction uh, for your son and, and brain damage, you can really use this opportunity to do to move into a whole healing re regimen that can reverse uh, the process to begin with and then leave your son with a strong foundation for many other aspects of life. Okay. And just as one little addition to what Warren said, because the research does say that the ADHD drugs, the standard ones that are given, uh, do cause brain damage. Uh, over after a couple of years. However, I like to reframe that as brain injury. And just as you break an arm, if you provide the right healing elements, the brain can heal. Yes. So it's actually injury caused by this uh, drug-induced state, whereas, and the brain will, just like if you take other street drugs, uh, if you're, there's brain injury that takes place. But healing is possible with the right knowledge. And that's what we want to do is provide the behavioral knowledge, the insight, as well as the nutritional side of it as well. Okay, yeah. great. I, there's a lot to this, and that's one aspect of uh, this whole boy crisis we're talking about. And as, as we talk about, <laughs> the, the title of the book is a very captivating title to me. I, for one, as I've mentioned to both of you before we started, I have two boys myself. At the moment, they're six and nine. And so I worry, I, and I myself came from all boys, mm -hmm. just like you came from almost all boys. Right, from <laughs> Texas. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and so who, tell me about the boy crisis as a general idea, and we'll get into some of the meat and potatoes of, of this book and the, the statistics and so forth. And who is this book for? Yes, uh, before I do that, now let me ask you, um, since you have a six and nine year old son, as you read The Boy Crisis, what was the most, where did it help you with your, your sons? Great question. The entire book is divided up into some great parts where you talk about the purpose void, you talk about uh, the importance of fathers and of course mothers and the balance that should exist. Mm -hmm. And no one ought to believe that this is all just about uh, magnifying boys but it's about a crisis that exists. And so uh, something that's, that I, I've come to realize is that in our society for uh, ever, <laughs> it's always been survival. And boys have been, we go hunt, and we provide, and we, pr we protect, and we go to war. And in the recent generations, that hasn't been the case. And so there's a lot of education that I gleaned from this whole work that you guys put out for us. Um, but the statistics, too, of uh, fatherlessness and things in the neighborhoods uh, that go on throughout our society, both in America and throughout the world, mm -hmm. um, it, it got me thinking more on the single individual home and family situation, whether there's a divorce or not, mm -hmm. uh, what goes on at that level. And, you know, I've, I talked to, this morning we did another interview, in fact, with the CEO of nobully.org. We talked a lot about some, mm -hmm. and you talk at length in the book about things that exist with bullies as well. So it's, it's just about being cognizant and, uh, and aware and in communication, connecting with our boys and making sure this is what I've learned. To answer your question, you're interviewing me now. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to just say something that came to mind while you're talking. Go ahead. Is, there's, you know, as a father, raising your children, wanting to make sure they have the best experience of life, it's often fathers don't recognize their importance yes. and their role yeah. in being there for the child. They just, you know, in particular, society doesn't recognize it. And how are you supposed to know as a man? And how's your wife supposed to know? Because there's an instinctive parenting style that we talk about in the book, which is different for men and different for women. Mm -hmm. Those differences exist, and it's the harmonizing of those two things that actually creates the harmony inside of the child. But yeah. he has to have both the messages of the father and both the messages of the mother. And when you actually get into the brain function, 
you see that it's the father's presence that stimulates normal dopamine function. Mm. And it's the mother's presence, it's the nurturing, the soothing, the cuddling, the connection, that stimulates the serotonin function. So you've got these two functions in the brain, literally, they get stimulated when you're with mom or when you're with dad. You know, rough and tumble play stimulates dopamine. So when you don't get this presence of a father that you're aspiring to have him be proud of you, you know, I think as men, we all know that as we experience greater success, we want our parents to be proud of us, particularly our fathers to be proud. Yeah. That is a big dopamine stimulator. That's a motivator mm -hmm. to get that recognition, that appreciation, that admiration. We want that. We want it from our fathers. And we don't get it from our father. We want it from our mothers too. But the father part of it is very, very important. Those are dopamine stimulators. And then suddenly you see this rise of ADHD type symptoms in boys which is ADD is a drug, the drug they give is a dopamine stimulator. It's literally like trying to fill in the parent void, the purpose void that mm. Warren talks so bra bravely about and clearly about. Yeah, okay, yes. So our role as men and, and raising our sons really needs to be redefined, which is what we've done in this book. And, mm -hmm. and part of what I ask dads to do is I basically say, dads, don't blame this on moms. If single moms, children do not do nearly as well when they are raised by single moms. But one of the reasons is that dads don't read, whether it's the boy crisis or we don't grow up reading parenting books and, you know, and, and, and books, um, magazines on parenting and look at those articles. And so we don't explain to moms what we do that's of value, nor do we even know. So I'll give an example of that. When um, one of the biggest differentiators, and the, there's 10 differences that I talk about, that we talk about in the boy crisis between dad style parenting and mom style parenting, one of those differences is roughhousing. So a mom sees a dad roughhousing, and the first thing she's saying to herself is, you know, God, I just have one more child to monitor. <coughs> and she's looking over and saying to herself, um, you know, if this keeps up, I know what's going to happen. Um, sooner or later, they're going to have, you know, somebody's going to cry, somebody's going to hurt, hurt somebody else. Um, but I don't really, I see they're having a lot of fun. I don't want to be controlling. <laughs> so I'll back off and sort of let this happen. Um, but sure enough, um, sooner or later, they do have a collision or that somebody cries or, mm. you know, whatever. And mom says to herself, you know, now I'm really feeling badly that I wasn't more proactive and I didn't save this from happening. And then she's astonished that dad goes back to the roughhousing uh, that created this crying to begin with and saying like, you know, yes, he is a child. Um, after all, he has no idea what he's doing because dads don't explain what's happening. And what's happening is, uh, well, first of all, I'll just give you the outcomes. We know that when dads roughhouse with children a lot, that they create a much deeper bond with the children. Mm -hmm. And that bond with the children allows them to establish boundaries that they can enforce without the children feeling rebellious or resentful. Um, third, the children that roughhouse with dad are far more likely to be empathetic now, you can, you, nobody ever connects empathy with roughhousing, but what happens, uh, and they're also more likely to help the children be able to distinguish between being assertive versus being aggressive, which every parent wants for their children. So the connection between roughhousing and this goes like this. Um, Dad, um, say they're wrestling, and, the, and there's three children, say John, Jane, and Jimmy. And so um, Dad will tend to throw John, Jane, and Jimmy onto the couch. And the game is to um, get John, Jane, and Jimmy, Jimmy to pin Daddy down before Daddy pins the three of them down together. And so in the excitement of doing that, uh, John you know, pushes James, Jimmy aside, and, you know, and somebody hurts Jane. And uh, eventually Dad says, um, okay, you can't do this, and you can't hurt an elbow that way in order to pin me down. You've got to be considerate of each other's feelings. Uh, and normally speaking, every parent would say, you've got to be considerate of each other's feelings. But this time they've, um, they get that lecture and they said, well, roughhouse, but if you continue doing what you're doing, that'll be the end of the roughhousing. And now the children are experiencing emotional intelligence under fire. Can they hold on to the ability to handle somebody else's uh, needs, but aside from their own, when they're excited to win in this game? And almost invariably, they can't. And so dad says something like, okay, I promise that if you did that, there'd be no more roughhousing. And because he's built that bond, he can establish that, that in boundary enforcement without resentment. And then the children realize the next time that he gives that warning, that they're gonna either, they're gonna lose the roughhousing completely if they don't think of their, the, uh, their sister or brother's feelings, which begins the process of learning how to empathize, not because empathy is what they 
would learn if they got a lecture, because when mom lectures to them the same thing as dad does, but doesn't enforce the boundary of losing the roughhousing, uh, the kids just, the, the, the incentive to think of somebody else's feelings is not great enough. So mom has to keep repeating herself. And mom then look over and says, I really resent the fact that with all the time I spend with my kids, when I give them a warning, they don't pay any attention to me. But when dad gives them a warning, he just says it once and they pay attention to him. Mm. Maybe it's his deeper voice. No, dads with <laughs> deeper voices do not have any greater impact on, on the children's ability to obey if they don't enforce the boundaries. And so what dad doesn't explain all this, nor does he explain that this boundary enforcement is the beginning of helping the children have postponed gratification. Mm -hmm. It also helps the children have less ADHD. So children raised predominantly by dads are only 15% likely to have ADHD. Children ra raised predominantly by moms 30% likely to have ADHD wow. because dads, via the boundary enforcement, um, are forcing the children to get their rewards by focusing on doing what they need to do, think of their sister's and brother's feelings, rather than focusing on what they want, which is me being the kingpin in the, in the wrestling match. Mm -hmm. And so moms don't know that behind this roughhousing that seems so irresponsible and kid-like um, is an enormous set of unconscious intelligence. And dad goes back to doing the roughhousing with the kids because mm -hmm. but he's given them a warning. Now he's asking the children to put that warning into practice. If he didn't return to the roughhousing, it would just be a lecture in absence of practice. Mm -hmm. And so the return to the roughhousing may be out of instinct and fun, but it has a it had has an underlying purpose that no I've never heard any dad explain to any mom. Yeah, and, and we're talking about, as you point out, thank you for explaining all that, the boundaries, impulse control, mm -hmm. delayed yes. gratification. You talk in the book something that was fascinating to me, this thing where many a fight has taken place between husband and wife over this topic, right, yeah, Imagine yes. with uh, You talk about a three-part process that happens where the child loses, mm -hmm. and then tears, crying happens, mm -hmm. and then move on. Mm -hmm. But sometimes moms have a hard time with that whole uh, process because moms don't want, and dads don't want to see kids cry either yes. but there's there's different uh, elements that contribute from both parents and, and moms sometimes might need to correct me if I'm wrong because I can't speak for the ladies but you can speak a little as your research in your book might need to step back a little and just let it unfold naturally. Absolutely. And and know what the value of it unfolding naturally is and that there's you know that the dad is just not an irresponsible parent because he returns to that rough housing after there's a problem that there's actually you know, whether the dad is doing it consciously or unconsciously, there is a positive purpose that is coming out of this for the children, the exact same purpose that the mother wants. No mother does not want her child to not be able to complete homework, to not be able to um, rehearse for sports and do all those mm -hmm. things that make the child successful and happy. Okay. You know, when we're talking about this role of the father and, <coughs> and setting the boundaries, another role of the father, of the masculine, and for the boy growing up, which is also helpful for little girls too, to be able to trust the masculine, is, and this is something which again, we look at the men are from Mars, women are from Venus, a distinction of what we bring to the table to harmonize with equal respect for both sides, Yes, is women have the innate ability to think ahead. They're, they're anticipating what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen in terms of protection, okay? Make sure you put on your jacket. Make sure you do this. Have you done this? It's it's always there's a projection into what could happen if. So she's the protective, so to speak. Not that men don't want to protect either, but the masculine comes in from a different perspective. Instead of anticipating problems, it's <coughs> solving problems. What a father gives to the children is the ability to go, oh, problem? No problem. We'll solve it. We'll fix it. We'll handle it. Life doesn't have to be perfect. We, when life is imperfect, what a boy learns from his dad and what a little girl learns from her dad too, is when life's not perfect, what do we do? We fix it. 
We don't have to protect ourselves and try to create a bubble of protection and extreme safety. Safety is important, but it can go overboard. It can be smothering. It can be overly nurturing. And dad is the force of more detachment. It's more like, let's do this. And mom says, well, wh wh what are you going to do when you get there? And he hasn't even thought of it. You know, I, I think back to a fun experience in my own marriage with Bonnie, which was uh, a what I realized is she was overwhelmed. I was, we have a more traditional relationship. I'm working, she's home with the kids, and I just mm -hmm. said, honey, you need a day off. Yeah. So you're gonna have this day off. And I got three <laughs> little girls here, and, and, so, and so she's gonna go off and have her day off. And, and then she says, so what are you gonna do with the kids? I said, I'm not gonna tell you. And what I understood as well is that when I'm in charge of the kids and she's not around, I bond with them more. If I'm always, connecting with her on everything it's kind of like she's leading the pack so i was going to do this experiment i said no no i'm not going to tell you what i'm going to do i want you to just forget it and she says no i want, really want to know <laughs> I said, you don't trust me with the kids she says i really want to know so i told her okay i'm taking the kids to stinson beach which is about 30 minute drive from our house and uh and she says oh well that's a good idea did you pack the, the their jackets <laughs> and I went, no. And she says, that's why you have to check with me. And I said, no, that's not why I have to check with you. Because we would have gotten to Stinson Beach. We would have discovered if it's too cold, I would solve the problem. We would go and do something else. They would see problem. Dad calmly and coolly in a, st a stable sense says, no problem. We'll fix it. We'll solve it. And that's what kids can learn, particularly from that male energy coming into their life is there's a fix for everything. Mm -hmm. And also from their mother's side is let's think ahead and protect ourselves. But the dynamic that I was experiencing and really helped in my own bonding with my children was there were times when she wasn't always guiding this, guiding everything. Oh, well, have you done this? Have you done this? But it was all up to me. Because I found as a man, if somebody leads me, and this is borne out in studies as well, with, 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 particularly with men, mm -hmm. and that is that if you're in a group of people and they're guiding you somewhere, like you're driving your car and you're following somebody, it's hard to remember how to get there because you're just mindlessly following. It's easy just to follow. But if you have to figure out those directions on your own, and if it's all on your own, meaning you feel you're totally responsible and accountable for what happens, you will remember it more. You will actually bond with that whole route and you'll be able to remember it better. And most people can relate to that. Right, right. You own it as yourself, mm -hmm. as opposed to there's a tendency with men, we love our wives and they have all these concerns and sometimes worries and so forth. Okay, just yield, go with that and you don't bond then as I'm taking charge of the situation and men need that that's a very important thing and boys need to feel their fathers taking charge not disrespecting in any way but taking charge and leading mm -hmm. leadership is a very important thing for boys to learn yes and yes the way, the way I translate that in the boy Christ book is to call this checks and balance parenting mm -hmm. uh, where instead of the mother the father feeling like Okay, every time I get into this discussion about Stinson Beach or whatever with the mom, um, I, and she doesn't, and I don't do what she wants me to do, like prepare everything ahead of time, I get into a big fight. All right, I move to, so the next time I don't even take the kids to Stinson Beach. I don't, um, because what am I being rewarded for? I'm being rewarded. One thing that she doesn't argue with me about is when I earn more money. So I'll go back to earning more money again. And so then the, ch then the father sort of starts neglecting the children mm -hmm. and doesn't give them these experiences of, um, of, of being at, being out of control and discovering how to get back into control, being outside of one's comfort zone, taking the kids skiing and they, and they fall and they go down, they want to go down an advanced slope, they fall down and then and later the kids tell mom you know I went I went, fell down and I hurt myself and oh really what did you you know which slope did you go down I went down the advanced slope daddy let me do that no wonder you fell how could he possibly let you do that mm. but you know the child is beginning to learn. Can I, can I do the advanced slope or can't I? You know, what can I do to master that advanced slope? Or should I have not, should I have waited and done it, uh, a, a different slope first? Mm. Should I have gotten instructions rather than, than just taking it on my own? All these things boys do so much better when they can experiment, make mistakes, um, correct their own mistakes rather than being prevented from making mistakes to begin with. Mm. And so dads have a tendency to be able to operate out of the, 
help help children and encourage children to operate out of their consult, out of their comfort zone. And you see this in school too. Like if a kid um, has a parent and uh, a teacher rather, let's say Mrs. Moyers, and Mrs. Mo and he comes home and he says, you know, Mrs. Moyers hates me. I want to be out of that class. And the mom was likely to say, well, you know, you're in third grade. I don't want you to have a foundationally bad experience in school. I'll go to the principal and I'll try to help you get a, a you know a different teacher. Dad is more likely to say. You know, sweetie, um, in life you're not going to get along with everybody. Mm. What would Mrs. Moyers say is her problem with you? I don't want to talk about the problem. And mom, you know, well, wait a minute. Why are you blaming him? <laughs> you know, but you know, from a dad's perspective, he wants to help there be a dialogue between Mrs. Moyers and the son or the daughter to discover what can be done to move out of an uncomfortable situation that does not involve saving the child, but help, helping the child share accountability with Mrs. Moyers. Yeah, so, so we're talking about balancing the parenting and maybe each parent giving each other some more benefit of the doubt and yeah. a, little, a little leeway to, to let their natural instincts as a mother or father unfold as they're supposed to. And, it, and, and as you talk in the book, one of the things that I thought, and I've thought this for a long time as well, but it says that one of the most, it says the most important tool a son can have is a family dinner night, even if it's just yes. once a week, yes. preferably every night, mm -hmm. hopefully, but that that's also not just that it exists, that we're all mm -hmm. just sitting eating, staring at our phones, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that there's a proper uh, conducting of that family dinner night by mother and father. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about that, if you would. Yes, the family dinner night, first of all, it being um, systematic and at least once a week. And then the rules being really clear uh, that there are no electronics at family dinner night. And so, and if, you know, some of the, some parents sometimes come up to me and say, I can't get my kids to give up the electronics. And the moment they say that, I know that the children are in charge of the parents, mm -hmm. not the parents in charge of the children. Yeah. Now, yes, you can get your children to give up electronics at the beginning uh, at a family dinner night. There is no dinner if with, you know, with the electronics. So you either have dinner or the electronics and there's no dinner later. Mm -hmm. If there's not, not that, and uh, electric, and if you want to be taken anywhere by the car, you want any type of allowance, you want us to do anything to facilitate you in any way. If you don't, if you don't obey by you know the rules and, and understand what, that there's things required of you, then there will be none of those privileges. Many parents have no sense of the numbers of things that they do for their kids that can be taken away if if the children are feeling that they need to feel like they have to rule. And so the next big important part of family dinner night is that everybody has a chance to speak. And secondly, that everyone has a chance to be heard without being interrupted. And that everyone's truth is their own story that is that, that the family teaches everyone to hear that there's not a correct story. That dad's gonna have his version of things, mom's gonna have his her version, um, and the, the, each of the kids are gonna have their version that it will be, even if they've gone through the same experiences, versions of life do not have to match. That you are nurturing the children's understanding to listen to everyone's point of view. And so those are a few of the, you know, the five major guidelines that in the boy crisis for the for the family dinner night not to become a family dinner nightmare. Okay. And, and you know, some, <coughs> little pra some little practical tips, you know, for doing that is, the tendency of both mothers and fathers to immediately correct their children or give advice. Yes. You know, we want to give advice to our children, but you notice, and most parents will say this, their children want to hear, don't want to hear their advice eventually, uh, particularly as they become teenagers, back off, back off. And that's really because there was a lot of unsolicited advice prior to that. Now, they need our guidance, but you have to sense, there has to be some intuitive sense of when a child is really looking for some advice. And... What we do instinctively is give advice. Oh, no, that's not the case. Or what you, you look at it this way. Or, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, fathers kind of make jokes. Oh, that's silly. That's, it's a put down. It's a put down. It's a put down. And children just stop opening up. So there's things you can say instead. Say less and instead say things like, well, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. Or help me understand that better. Or what else? You know, or tell me more. These are really good little phrases to use rather than to 
give advice to your kids and actually don't give advice until they're really look, well, what should I do? You know, or, you know, make them hunger for it. Uh, That's going to be heard by the child as opposed to that resistance. And every parent knows when your kids are resisting you, your tendency is to push harder. Look at them. Look at me. It's only because you've been giving too much information when they weren't open to receiving it. So these are like, children need to be seen and heard. This is the new generation. Maybe in previous generations, it's a totally different story. But kids today, you know, there's a greater consciousness. My children are much more brilliant than me, and they want... They, they need more self-authenticity. We're living in a, you know, an authentic world, and it means see me, hear me, touch me, feel me, validate me. You don't have to agree with everything a child says. Of course not. But you want to hear it and look at it and let, let them feel a part of the family. And, and then one child makes fun of the others. You say, no, you don't do that. You know, you correct the child, you know, mm-hmm. what are you thinking? And we can all have a different point of view here. These are really important aspects of brain development even is to recognize that there is facts are rare and that most everything is an opinion. It's a point of view and we can all have different points of view and perspective without being wrong. Mm. Uh, and that is particularly as they get to the teenage years, a very important part of brain development along with the development of algebra, uh, which is abstract thinking. People who don't have that abstract thinking, they tend to be my way or the highway. There's only one truth, and I'm making it up, and it's right. This rigidity to right and wrong as opposed to an embracing of differences, which is the world we're trying to create. We can integrate different perspectives. Ultimately, mother and father demonstrate that by integrating their perspectives and validating each other. Just the greatest gift, I just tell parents over and over, the greatest gift you can give to your sons and daughters is... To not speak poorly of your partner. If you're divorced, to not speak poorly of your partner. You know, there's this tendency to, you know, get your kids off to the side and vent to them about the spouse. That's not a good thing. You can't put that on children. They're not Mm -hmm. capable of that. You need to talk to a friend or a therapist or somebody else as opposed to putting down your partner. And the journey that we have to go through as men and women to let go of our judgments and our criticisms of our partner, that's our inner work to find that acceptance and appreciation of their efforts, knowing that everybody's imperfect, but it's okay, we're moving forward, we love each other, we're a family. These are the important values that we're just not being taught today. And it's so important to keep mom and dad together, but it's the gift is, and the motivation sometimes, is look what I'm doing to my child or look what I can do for them by finding mm-hmm. forgiveness and love. Because that's the, that's the key, is to find the love. Yeah, and, th- and that reminds me too a little bit of uh, Stephen Covey's seven habits. One of them is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Where, mm-hmm. And he teaches a lot in there about mm-hmm. hearing somebody, especially in a parent-child relationship, mm-hmm. hearing them. And my dad did a good job. Hi, Dad, thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> When you said something to him, uh, and none of us are perfect, including my dad, sorry dad, (laughs) at the same time, (laughs) but kind of repeating it back. And so what you're saying is you want to go to this concert and be up till four in the morning, even if you don't agree at all, repeating it back so that they know you heard me and you respect that I had something to say, that I have a request, that whatever the case might be at the family dinner night or or one-on-one. That's what I'm hearing from a lot of this and a lot of the other. You had a lot of good stuff, and you want to add. And, and I just want to add that even if you don't do the mirroring and the repeating it back, just that you remember the concept. If you want your children to listen to you, you've got to listen to them more. Yes. Yeah, it's as simple yes. as that. And listening more doesn't have to be reflecting back. That's a nice thing to do. It can be. It can become a bit mechanical. Kids can see through it and say, "You're just repeating back." Sometimes they don't. <laughs> but you want to take the time to truly understand. Help me understand that better. Okay, I see. That's a good idea. Well, that makes sense to me. Okay, or you elaborate. Tell, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Elaborate, and also sometimes tell a little story about. You know, I can relate to that. One time, this happened to me. Yeah. You know, my kids were always saying to me, Dad, well, how do you relate to that? You know, because they felt I was right there with them. And I always had a way of relating and sharing and and being a bit transparent in terms of how I've gone through similar things. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, validating to the being that you love more than anybody. And I'll just emphasize again, it's so easy to love our children. That that's their part of us easier than to love our spouse. But use your love for your children to motivate you to love your spouse because that is what's going to help your child the most. Okay. Not just loving your child. You love your child by loving that partner that created that child with you. Mm-hmm. And so if you're having a divorce, you can still practice 
creating an unconditional love for that person, not bad-mouthing them, creating a positive space to interact if the differences were just too great. Yeah, yeah. And what did you want to Yeah, I so agree with John. Uh, those are brilliant com comments. Um, the, one of the things I think we can really do at Family Dinner Night is to take any type of uh, statement that a, a kid makes and say, if, if one of your friends was saying this, uh, what would be your feedback to your friend? And then you facilitate the advice, that, the internal advice that your son or your daughter has inside of them that, they can, that they, they can give. And they become, in a sense, the adult. They become the advisor. They become the mentor. What we, one of the things I found in doing the research for the boy crisis was, was that children need mentors. They help, their, they grow a great deal from mentors, but they grow even more from being a mentor. And so when you even ask them to imagine at family dinner night, suppose you had a younger person who was asking the same thing about, about this problem that you're presenting, how would you advise them? How would you guide them? And suddenly you're bringing out of them not the child, but the adult in them. And you're making the, and you're helping and facilitating them become their own adult, mm. and and uh, bring that side of them out, and that is extreme, and, and that shows an enormous respect for the child. So when you give advice, you're basically saying, um, I am smarter than you are, either from life experience or from in intelligence, and often we are, mm. but it's <laughs> more facilitative for the child to feel like his or she or he is being respected so much that the advice is being asked of him or her. Yeah. The second thing I want to say that John was commenting on that's so important is this talking negatively about one's spouse. Um, the time that this is most damaging, it's damaging at all times, like John was saying, it is most damaging, though, after divorce. And it's most damaging for boys. Um, so when, when, we, when boys and girls are uh, products of divorce, they both do significantly worse if there's minimal or no father involvement. However, boys do considerably worse proportionally than girls do. The telomeres of boys um, shrink. That is, the ability, the telomeres are, are what is in every cell, and your telomeres hold genes that, um, that will either reproduce or not reproduce to be able to prevent you from having cancer and other problems. And so when boys, wow. when boys have a minimal amount of father involvement or no father involvement by the age of nine, they have telomeres that are 16, 17% shorter than if they have father involvement. For girls, they have telomeres that are about nine or 10% shorter um, as a result of having no father involvement. And so the, the importance of fathers um, n not being bad-mouthed um, after divorce is that the, ch the children, um, th when you're bad-mouthing the spouse, your child looks in the mirror and sees like if dad is being, if, if, she is, if the child is hearing, my dad's a liar, he's a narcissist, um, he's somebody that's irresponsible. Well, a child looks in the mirror and says, well, maybe I'm half my dad. I see my body language is like my dad, my nose and my eyes are like my dad, my hair is like my dad. So maybe I'm irresponsible, maybe I'm a narcissist. Mm. I am after all looking in the mirror. Mm. Uh, maybe I'm you know, not, you know, not good. I'm gonna be a liar too. I did lie to Joe down last week. Um, and so all these fears set in, but the child can't take those fears to dad because he's for afraid of destabilizing the relationship between his mother and father even more as a result of an argument, as a result of him saying this to his dad. He can't t t take it to his mother because the mother is often the predominant parent. And so he's at a loss and he doesn't talk about his feelings to friends. He's a male. And so you know, he's left with all this sitting inside of him, the fear that he is a liar, he's a narcissist, he's irresponsible inherently. That's the damage that bad mouthing the other parent does but particularly if you have a son who is far more vulnerable to the um, insecurities after divorce, is far more vulnerable to feeling like my dad has deserted me, and far more vulnerable to not having a male role model to teach him how to um, find purpose in an era where we have a purpose void for boys. Mm, absolutely. I, and as we talk about this with dads being around or not, and it's, it's a growing dilemma uh, plague perhaps in our society where fathers aren't near as present and I, and, I, and I took a bunch of notes when I was 
uh, going through the book about some of the statistics you talked about where in general there's lower IQ mm -hmm. uh, you talked about you know ISIS fighters and things that a lot of times they don't have a father figure present in their world and they, I wouldn't say a lot of times it's literally yeah. almost always yes, almost three, always three yeah. female sociologists studied ISIS fighters they didn't even ask a question about father involvement but it came up so frequently that they went back and did, you know, being scientists, they went back and did a systematic asking of that question, and they found that of all the ma variables that they measured for, that lack of father involvement among ISIS recruits um, was the single biggest um, correlation of anything that they wow. that they asked questions about. And this is, by the way, is a much smaller percentage of female ISIS fighters. But even among the females, this was the lack of father involvement uh, was the dominant um, discovery that they uh, that they had. And, and I like that in the book you point <coughs> out that uh, it gave them excitement and purpose. You talk about the purpose void yes. by being a part. And this is the same thing with gangs, and it's the same kind of uh, mentality and principle. Hit, Hitler Youth, um, the, what Hitler learned to look for. Uh, for Hitler Youth was boys without fathers, so that they have a substitute father figure. Gang leaders, they know that this is boys without fathers. And what I was most astonished about is the research on mass shooters. Almost all A boys, not girls, which gives you a sense of the disproportionate vulnerability of boys, mm -hmm. um, to father involvement. People say, you know, uh, mass shooters is about guns, it's about bad values on TV, it's about violence on TV, it's about fa bad family values, but girls have access to the same guns, same family values, same violence on TV. They're not doing the shooters, it's, and it's not just boys doing the shooters shoot, shooting, it is the mass shootings are almost all boys with minimal father involvement or no father involvement, looking for sort of some way of having, usually it's boys that have gone, that don't have postponed gratification, that have um, done badly in school, they have no rewards from school, they have no rewards from parents, it's uh, parents, they don't have, uh, the, when, when it comes to boy-girl time, girls are not very interested in dating losers who don't do well in anything, and mm. so they date the winners and they feel left out and angry, and so sometimes that anger is taken out of like, I, you know, people don't, I, I feel invisible, if I shoot up this school or if I do this mass shooting, I'll no longer be invisible and people will wonder, what could I have done differently to pay attention? attention to Johnny, you know, and so, uh, not this Johnny, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he included, uh, right, but all of us. Yeah, and, and these statistics to me, and this was some of what hit me the hardest, this entire book is powerful, and I, if we had 10 hours to sit and chat, we wouldn't cover even everything that, that we need, I think the audio book is 15 hours, excellent, excellent material, and, and some of the statistics also, and thank you for explaining all that, two to two and a half times more likely to have trouble with the law before age 25 with mm -hmm. fatherlessness. Substance abuse, depression, mental health, you talk at length and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, fatherlessness predicts the profile most accurately of both the bully and the bullied. Mm -hmm. And absence of father is the single greatest contributing factor to child and adolescent suicide. Yes which to me was also mind-boggling that that's the single greatest common thread i guess we could say mm -hmm. statistically with, statistically I mean, this, is, this is reality these mm -hmm. children have greater greater challenges and i'll s spend a second on suicide for a moment please at age nine boys and girls before adolescence commit suicide at an equal amount uh, of time um, an equal frequent percentage fre of frequency mm -hmm. between 10 and 14 boys commit suicide twice as much as girls as the testosterone tends to set in, the male role and expectations tend to set in. Between 15 and 19, it goes from two to four times as frequently. Between 20 and 25, it's five and a half times as frequently wow. that boys commit suicide versus girls. But then, that's just boy-girl. But then among the boys that commit suicide, the single biggest predictor is lack of father involvement from those uh, with those boys, and so if you real if you uh, so for all the reasons we talked about before that John and I have been talking about, fathers, boys without dads, they don't have a role model, and they their old senses of purpose 
be a warrior, be willing to be disposable in war, be a sole breadwinner, which is no longer um, an, an automatic definition of masculinity because women have relieved, relieved us of some of that burden by sharing the breadwinner role. But the, that's the good news. And the, and the good news is also that we don't need so many boys in war. But the bad news is that the old senses of purpose are creating a purpose void. And so boys with both a purpose void and a dad void are purposeless and drift and without a sense of purpose and no postponed gratification to accomplish any dream that they do have, they're lost mm. and they're rudderless. And this is what I say more than any other combination of things when we did the research for the boy crisis, this is what we found is leading so many boys into crisis mode and withdrawing into video game addiction or porn addiction. And instead of being able to deal with the subtleties of real life girls, uh, we fill up our dopamine with um, uh, the stimulation for more risky behavior with girls in porn, which only then makes us, when we have a real life experience with girls, the girls are feeling like we, they, we want something from them that they're not willing to give, that we've just seen in a pornography uh, movie. They feel treated like, uh, like objects. They withdraw from them, which only makes our sons convinced that they cannot deal with real life women and sends them back to porn. Mm. <laughs> so, um, vicious is, cycles all vicious around. Cycles. And, and uh, you know, a, a simple idea here is, well, when it comes to marriage, what are the incentives for couples to stay, to stay together versus to separate? And right now we live in a political system that actually gives people an incentive, gives mothers particularly an incentive to be single because mm -hmm. then you get alimony and so forth. You get more alimony if you're not sharing time with your spouse. We should be giving incentive. I'm not against that incentive. I say we should have a greater incentive for couples who stay together. That should be part of it. If we're going to give incentives for single parents, whether it be the man or the woman, we should give a greater incentive if you stay together. Because one might say, oh, well, do you really need that support? You need the incentive. That's what we're looking at. And to have a greater incentive of financial support, which runs a lot of our motivations, mm. to be single and to be the primary caretaker of your children and the other partner have to be responsible to send money your way, that can breed resentment in the other person and it can also create a motivation to focus on why I must have the child. Mm. So incentives are very important. So that's just another thing to keep in consideration in our society today, which is breaking down due to the breakdown between men and women. Mm -hmm. Divorce is, is tearing us apart. Mm. And what we've done here is showing not just us as adults, it's showing how it's affecting the family unit. And I, I don't judge people who get divorced because relationships today are hard. They're very, very difficult today, primarily because we don't have the skills to fulfill this purpose void. For a man, what am I doing for the wife? You know, for the wife, you know, why do I need a man? You know, there's suddenly like a whole new knowledge has to occur, which is for men to realize that, yes, we're no longer the warrior. We're no longer the bread, bread earner that she primarily depends on. Well, what's our job? There's a whole new relationship skill, which is the job for personal fulfillment through good communication, through romance, through intimacy, through sex. This should be fulfilling for both men and women. And suddenly a man has a new role in the marriage, which is a provider of an emotional safety, a provider of good communication, a provider of caring, that actually women need a whole lot because the more they're in the workplace, the more they need some support to come back to feeling loving and to feeling sensitive and vulnerable and safe. So we have a whole new set of new relationship skills that are required so that a boy grows up and sees that, oh, I can be like my dad and make a woman happy. Hmm. What picture do we have of that for these boys who don't even see their dads? My goodness. No, yes. and, I, and, I, and I think, too, uh, there's so much to be said for that. That is such a powerful set of statements mm -hmm. about families and this breakdown, this degradation, if you will, perhaps, of the family unit, of marriage as an institution, and uh, we're not commenting on gay marriage, any of those things. We're commenting on parental involvement. Mm -hmm. We're commenting on uh, connection, love, and just direct involvement. And one other thing, I'm just one other statistic before I forget to cover this is, and this was one thing that really hit me hard too, with every 1% increase of fatherlessness in neighborhoods, there's a 3% increase in violent crime. Yes. So we're, we're yes. talking about fatherlessness 
and how that contributes. And we talk, and you talk at length in the book about the dad brain. Yes. And one of the things that I remember, and you can elaborate here too, is before you become a dad, there's the testosterone, the whole things that lead us to be, to find a mate instinctually and so forth. And then afterwards, it, we talk about these neurotransmitters. The uh, dopamine, the testosterone, uh, the serotonin. Oxytocin. The, yeah, mm -hmm. oxytocin, all those things. All those things, yes. And these are all, uh, and then it, it, it adjusts with the dad brain when they start holding hands, walking with a child, yeah. loving a child. You want to elaborate on any of that sure. or the other things we're touching yeah, on? Yeah, let me I'll share th three things here. One is on the crime issue, second is on dad brain, and third is on the incentives that Jean was bringing up and how important these things are. Okay. So first, crime is pretty simple. Um, that if you, we often say that there's a lot of women's centers in this country, and that's really wonderful. Uh, and there are also, though, a lot of men's centers, and they're called prisons. And in those prisons, we know that there's 93% males. But of those 93% males, more than 90% of those males are also boys without father involvement of any significance. And so if we want to stop crime mm -hmm. and, and the enormous costs of crime on every level and prisons, the single biggest antidote is father involvement. Second is the incentives that John was talking about. We want to, uh, if, we, if, if we're giving incentives for mothers to receive more money f when the father's not around and we reverse the incentives like John was talking about and we require two things. One is father and mother to be together. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily have to live together if that's not a, uh, but they need to live within 20 minutes drive time with each other. They need to be going to relationship counseling and they need to be uh, making sure they don't badmouth each other. So if we want to give incentives, we need to do two, three, uh, we would, we need to do incentives that keep the mother, the biological mom and dad in contact with each other, but also create a couple's communication system that allows them to know how to communicate constructively rather than destructively. Because yeah. if they're divorced, we know they don't have that knowledge. Exactly, exactly. It's That's a given. Almost, almost by definition. Third is the... Um, is the, I said the incentive system, um, the crime, and uh, the dad brain. Yes, it is, yes. It is really important for dads to understand, and I did not know this before we started to do the research for the boy crisis, um, is that when dad is involved, when, a, when, a, when, a, when, an, infant, when an infant is born, mm -hmm. if that dad responds to the infant being born by going out and earning more money and is away from the child, creating the father's catch-22, that is, he learns to love the family by being away from the love of the family, nothing much happens with his brain. However, if he is deeply involved with the, the birth of the child, touching the mother's um, womb area, um, being um, there when the child is born, breathing, breathing over the child very shortly after it's born, uh, playing a great deal with the child when it's first born, his brain changes. There's a whole nest of dormant neurons that we now know for the first time in our lives mm. that begin to connect with each other that mimic but are not identical to the female uh, maternal instinct. It's his own version of a father instinct. But it only, uh, it only gets generated when that father is deeply involved with the children. Um, and so, the, the in, so when we say that there's this big mother instinct, but there's no father instinct, well, there's no father instinct if his behavior doesn't help that father instinct grow. But when it does help uh, get, get involved with the child, that, be, that dad brain grows and grows within weeks after the birth of the child. Wow, beautiful. I, uh, there's so many topics in this book. I wish we could just read through the whole book together <laughs> and, and then comment on all of it, and we could do about 12, 20 sessions of doing that. But uh, now, now we talk more about boundaries, and, and we talk about um, another thing that, that tends to go on with boys as far as we talk about the purpose void mm -hmm. and... And the thing about heroes and sports, there's all kinds of things connected here to what yes. goes on with boys uh, that are contributing to uh, things that are kind of maybe falling apart in our society and families. What, what do we want to elaborate on as far as this purpose void and, and what's going on as far as things shifting and how boys, uh, how things used to be? We talked about that a little bit earlier. 
John, you want to take that? Well, I had mentioned it a few minutes ago, which is we had a very clear vision of what a dad does. He goes to work and he supports the family. And he, the boy would see that he provides money. He would see the mother's very grateful and appreciative of that and dependent on that. So therefore, in order to make a woman happy, instinctively, all males want to please the female. Mm -hmm. We want to make the woman happy. We want to provide for her to have that happiness. Yes. Yes and yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, this is the bottom line. If, this is if women said, tomorrow we'll make love and, and admire and marry men who walk on their hands, we would be having hand-walking contests all <laughs> over the world within weeks. Yeah, yeah. that would... It, so you, you have to realize, here's a little boy who comes into the world. He wants to be able to make his mother happy. And so how, how does mom get happy? Well, he sees dad being a good listener. He sees dad taking mom out on a date. He sees dad helping mom around the house. He sees dad doing these things for mom. He gets the message, that's how I can fulfill mom. Yeah. Prior to this time and other generations, the father was out making money and mom was going, oh, dad makes money. I can get to do what I want to do because dad goes out and does that. I can spend more time with you. So the boy's purpose was to go out and make money because that would make mom happy. But when mom makes money on her own, that's no longer a significant purpose. Many women today feel like, well, what do I need another child for? I'm making as much money as him. Why am I supporting him? So once mom and dad are both financial providers, that significance of being the provider drops dramatically in the boy's awareness, but also in the mother's, because the mother's experience. You see, she can't suddenly go, oh, dad's out working hard for us and have enormous appreciation if she's also out working hard for us to make the money. It's literally, there's no, there's no deep-seated need for him. However, if she's out there being independent, you have to realize that she has a greater need for intimacy. She has a greater need to come back to more personal connection. The more impersonal you are, the balance that you want to find that personal. So what I have found as a relationship teacher is that women's needs over the last 30, 40 years have dramatically changed to suddenly the priority is not a man who makes a lot of money, but a man who's a good communicator, a man who has helps around the house, a man who provides a new level of emotional safety for women to share who they are. You see, in the past, women didn't have emotional safety. They didn't need, that wasn't a big need. They had other women, they had a day. Now suddenly they have a, you know, they're busy being men all day long. How do they come back to their feminine? New relationship skills. So a boy who grows up witnessing father providing happiness for mother has a clear picture of how I can make mom happy or make my partner happy one day. Gives him a clear sense of meaning and purpose in his life to good, do good, to help others as opposed to go out and fight a battle or give up your personal fulfillment. And one will talk more about this to give up your personal fulfillment in order to provide for the family, to sacrifice your own personal needs for your family. And that's a huge shift for the male, which is you don't have to sacrifice your personal needs to fulfill the family today. And I know Warren loves to talk on that, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so Go two ahead. things on this. One is that part of what John is describing is so important and so optimistic for both men and for women, because historically speaking, men were trained to have heroic intelligence, which was basically intelligence for a short life. Mm. To be uh, intelligence to know how to disconnect from your feelings. So when you were required to go to war, you didn't say, oh, this is, might hurt me. I w I'm okay about being disposable. I'll serve my country. I'll die uh, to serve my country. That was, it was functional to train men to have heroic intelligence, was to, which was to disconnect from everything that was emotionally connected to their feelings, to their heart, to their desire to be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Fulfillment was for wussies. It wasn't for a man who was being trained to die. Um, and you know, and if he and once he got mar um, once he got married, if he had children, he learned that. His job was not to be a teacher because that didn't make enough money. If he could make more money being a, a superintendent of schools or administrator, even if that wasn't his passion and he hated administration, he now had a new obligation, which was to raise money to, in order to raise children. 
um, if he if he was a local sales rep uh, who enjoyed selling locally, um, he learned that he had to take that position as a national sales rep um, because he would make enough money to support his children. If he was if he had no skills, he had to become an Uber driver and drive 70 hours a week. And you'll see that even today, 90% of Uber drivers are still males, and not because he wanted to have male power and male privilege by earning more money, but that he understood intuitively that it was not male privilege to earn more money or male power to earn more money. It was male obligation to earn more money, male responsibility to earn more money. It was being a dad so that if he drove that Uber, his children would be able to go to college and have opportunities that would allow them not to drive that Uber. And so he would then free them to have more options than he. And there's no greater opportunity here which is for, for families to understand than this, which is the that for the first time in history, women are going to be desiring men not with heroic intelligence, but with emotional intelligence. Yeah. And emotional intelligence is part of health intelligence. And health intelligence is training for a long life. And for the first time, men can ask different questions, which is to say, instead of being that administrator, maybe I will be a teacher who will earn less money and look for a woman who earns enough money to be able to provide with my teaching enough to take care of the children. And maybe we won't be the richest people around, but we find now the research shows us that depending on where in the United States you live, mm -hmm. when your family is earning between $50,000 and $75,000 a year, that, 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 that what benefits the family after that is not money, but time with the children. And particularly with dad, dad's time trumps dad's dime. Mm. So we really have an opportunity here to understand that the importance of men developing an emotional intelligence that values their time with the family, not their dime for the family. Yeah, yeah, and, and you, you talk about different elements of this purpose void, mm -hmm. and I appreciate you explaining that beautifully. And then we talk about a compassion void. He's talking about being there. Women need to feel cherished. Women mm -hmm. need to feel loved and respected and get the right kind of attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, and women can't get that if he's off all the time exactly. trying to make enough money. And that used to be the world we lived in before. We've mm -hmm. now moved into another space. And we're learning the skills of how men can provide a new kind of emotional support. But the confusion there... When Warren clearly says that women are looking for a new kind of emotional support, it doesn't mean becoming a girlfriend. Yeah. So there's, there's ways for men to be actually more masculine to provide that support. And for women to actually become more feminine, to become aware of their need for that kind of support. And this is what allows us as a balancing factor today. Mm -hmm. And this is like these, we need new relationship skills and the priority, the motivation to learn more, particularly as people get older, they think I know it all, is if you're not getting along with your partner, learn how to get along with your partner. Be motivated to find acceptance and forgiveness and take the time your partner needs for the benefit of your children, because we now know it has a huge impact on your children, the quality of your marriage. Yeah, there, there has to be an openness to make adjustments as needed, mm -hmm. but there's some general principles that apply across the board that we're talking about here. You know, many people will say, well, it's better for parents uh, to move on rather than be unhappy parents <laughs> with your children. And I think Warren has some statistics on that, but the bottom line from my perspective is if you're unhappy with your partner, do something to create happiness with your partner. And if you're not happy with your partner, usually you're missing the knowledge and the education of how to find that happiness. And while there's many, many insights that we need, one of them is to recognize that your partner, particularly for women to understand, think of your husband as dessert, not the main meal. Is it really, we put so much on our partners because in the beginning of relationships, the newness stimulates huge amounts of dopamine and pleasure. And what that does is the brain goes, oh, you have the power to make me happy. And we forget that we have the power within ourselves to be happy and that we're unhappy. It's our job. 
Now, I speak to large audiences all the time, and I say, now, audiences, whose responsibility is it to be happy in this world? And everybody goes, of course, it's my responsibility. That's the adult awareness that we're responsible for our happiness. But boom, now you get married, and if you're unhappy one day, it's always your partner's fault. And that's what we have to start recognizing. That fault finding in your partner, making your partner responsible for your unhappiness is neglecting your duty, not just to your children, but to yourself, to go, I have to find ways to find my own happiness without pushing my partner away. And that's challenging. These are all new insights. But at least those who are listening to this, who have the motivation to be there for your children, use that motivation to also learn new ways to be in relationship because we all have to learn that relationships today are extremely difficult and challenging and i'm saying that as well as we were talking earlier about the dinner di talking at the dinner table i remember one, one example of one of my children which is having problems with math and and i always help my kids with their math problems i'm very good at math mm -hmm. so i'd help them with the math and <laughs> Once they got to eighth grade, they're doing geometry. I'd forgotten all the formulas. And one of my brothers was there, and you know, he's like a math expert, you know. And so I said, Robert, you know, why don't you help? And my daughter Lauren, she says to Robert, Well, here's the problem. And Robert's reaction was, Oh, that's easy. And he thinks he's just, you know, being friendly, saying, oh, that's easy, just do this and this. Well, to my daughter, it was the feeling of, oh, I must be stupid because it doesn't look easy to me. Yes. And that's just that one little insight helped me so much because often we want to sort of show off how great we are or just be friendly and nice and go, oh, that's easy. I can tell you how to do that. But also to a child, that can tell them the message is that something's wrong with them because it's difficult and challenging for them. And we can expand that awareness that whenever a child is faced with a challenge, a quick solution diminishes their intelligence. Exactly. As opposed to, wow, that's challenging. Tell me more, like, that's a difficult thing, that must be hard. Just to give it the room to acknowledge that this is a difficult thing, and life is difficult these days. This Absolutely. Is, what John is saying is especially true for highly competent men who are, uh, one of the challenges I have, I teach couples communication workshops in, around the country, and um, oftentimes one of the biggest uh, challenges in those workshops are men who are CEOs or presidents of an organization or uh, wonderful entrepreneurs make their wives extremely happy in terms of success but when it comes to a problem that she brings up um, his, uh, when she's talking about the problem his mind is going how can I solve this problem quickly for her and so and the more quickly he solves it the more she feels not nourished uh, or nurtured by that but rather that basically that he's been able to solve a problem in two minutes that I can't haven't been able to solve in my lifetime does that you know what type of comment does that make about me and so it really it hurts the relationship more than helps the relationship but what we do need that we're both John and I have been really talking about for a long time here is that if we want things if we're going to focus on solutions one of the biggest solutions we can have <coughs> is a solution of having in our first and second and third grades um, communication skill training so that bully learns what the, the the person he might be tempted to bully is feeling mm -hmm. the more you know what a person is feeling how they are who they are what their past is what their concerns are the less likely you are to bully them the yeah. m bullying come and the, and the more you are seen you have the, the higher your self-concept becomes the less you have a need to bully I, you mentioned before that I that we talk about in the boy crisis how the bully and the bullied are both have similar personalities they both have uh, enormous low self-esteem mm -hmm. um, and so they um, are oftentimes in similar ways feeding on each other and so we need to we st start in school at an early age um, teaching boys and girls how to communicate uh, with each other but when we're doing that there can be an unintended consequence if we if we teach our sons and daughters in first second and third grade how to communicate with each other and then they go home and their parents can't communicate well they develop a contempt for their parents inability to communicate so we have to train the, the kids and their parents at the same time so that there's no parent-child gap that creates a lack of respect that would that will tear the family apart in a different type of way and second second another area i really want to talk to is that 
the importance here for single moms. We've been talking a great deal today about um, the importance of dads, but there are many women who, uh, even if they learn to value what their dads bring and try to tell the dads to come back into the family, for some moms that's not going to be possible. And if it isn't possible, um, I want to sort of hold up some things that we know really do mm -hmm. help children. Mm -hmm. One is getting your kids involved with Cub Scouts. Most of all of us as parents care more about our children's character development than any other single thing. And Cub Scouts uh, have been shown to really enhance children's character development, as do Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts combine a very good combination of developing the best of, best of masculinity and leaving the worst of masculinity behind. Yeah. Um, and we also need to get um, children involved with uh, f find your child a mentor, a male mentor. Find your child a faith-based community in which there's a good male pastor, rabbi, or priest that can that can not just help and work with your child, but get your child together with other groups of children from the same age who can who can talk about what they're going through so your son in particular doesn't feel so isolated. When a girl has problems, she usually will talk with other girls. When a boy has problems, he'll usually harbor, harbor the feelings to himself, disconnect, and that turns him into video games and, and other forms of addiction. Yeah. Uh, so these are some of just a few of the steps that I talk about and we talk about in the boy crisis uh, that you can use to, if, you, if, you, if there is no option, um, get your grandfather involved in a half dozen other options uh, for single moms that I want to make sure are out there as well. Don't st for single moms, don't stop your personal life because you don't have a spouse and dedicate it all to your children, Yes, particularly your sons. You don't look to them for that filling you up. You, they need to see that you're an adult getting your needs met, your adult needs met, and also you give to your children, of course. But that's a gift you give to them, is not looking to them to be the major source of your happiness. And if we want our sons to respect women, the way to get them to respect women is to do exactly what John just said, is for you as a woman to be fulfilling your own needs and not cater, not have becoming emotionally dependent upon um, uh, solving their problems for them. It's a lose for you, it's a lose for the children, and it's also a lose for helping your children respect women. Right, right. And, and boys, when these problems exist and so on, tend to, you know, back out of situations or escapism type of things, mm -hmm. the video games. And boy, there's a plethora of information. This book, I can't say enough how powerful this book is. You look at what's been written about this book, the most important book of the 21st century. We barely s scratched the surface, the tip of the iceberg of this thing. And I would encourage anyone and everyone out there to, whether you have boys or not, boys are part of all of our world regardless. And, and it doesn't discount anything with girls. There's a ton we could say about all that too. But uh, I can't say enough good things about this book. Do you have anything else you want to add as far as, and also to those who say the boy crisis is a myth because there's a ton of some of that and you address some of that a little bit in the book as we wrap up here. No, yeah, I think that um, I'm, I'm good. Well, I, I, I think we're wrapping up. I want to mention that a good portion of the book also addresses the, the concept of, of dopamine function in the brain. Yes. ADD is really an inhibited dopamine function. So to understand it very simply is dopamine gives us focus, motivation, pleasure, energy. Okay, so when you have normal dopamine function, life's normal responsibilities and activities give you pleasure and motivation. Cleaning your room, basically doing your homework, participating in the family, anything that will win your parents' approval, acceptance, and love is a major dopamine stimulator. So let's say your parents' love is stimulating, imagine for the analogy, uh, 50 ounces of dopamine, just to give a number with it. Well, guess what? Playing a video game produces 100 ounces. Being in a gang produces 200. Danger produces huge. So there's uh, addictions all produce 50, not just 50, the normal amount of dopamine being 100 or 200. So this is a higher dopamine stimulation. Mm -hmm. So more is better. But more importantly, more is better is as soon as you experience more, say 100 ounces of dopamine, your brain compensates and now 50 ounces of dopamine doesn't give you pleasure. 
So the bottom line is, with the high stimulation of dopamine in the world by being in gangs, danger, playing video games, yelling and screaming, all, like drama, any of these kinds of things is stimulate high dopamine stimulation. It desensitizes the brain to normal dopamine stimulation. So when you say to your child, I'd like you to eat your vegetables, the child says, no, they're not motivated to cooperate with mom and dad because you're not producing enough motivation in them. You're not producing enough dopamine in them. But if you say to them, oh, you can play your video game if you eat your vegetables, now they're motivated. Or you say, oh, you don't get dessert. If you eat dessert, then you, if you eat your vegetables, you'll get your dessert. So we're using these sugar as a high dopamine stimulator. Suddenly, parents' love is no longer enough to motivate your children. And that should be the basis of children's childhood, is I'm primarily motivated to cooperate, to be with my parents, to do as they say, to learn from them, and so forth. That's been lost today. We're using drugs to motivate our children. Yeah, and the yeah. answer to that is come back to taking away a lot of the excessive stimulation, providing extra nutrition that the brain is missing. And we go into great detail in the book on what parents can provide. Yeah, yeah. very, very thorough in that last section of the book. Mm -hmm. Love the interview. Love what you guys bring to the table. Any other events or anything, any projects, things that you want to talk about before we wrap up? Yes, completely? Uh, very important is the only time John and I will be doing a full weekend together on this issue uh, that we have scheduled is at 1440 Multiversity. Uh, which is the October uh, 26th through 28th. So it's a, a week from Friday. Mm -hmm. And so, um, it, and this is a really wonderful opportunity. We scheduled this late. Therefore, there will not be a huge number of people there. Therefore, you're, you and your, ch your kids, um, both invited, will have an enormous amount of time with John that would normally be very hard to access and perhaps also with me. Um, and so, but I'll be there and for the whole weekend and so will John and so will the, a wonderful a facilitator called Ashanti Branch, and as, as well as the people who, that Mark Schillinger, who runs the, um, who runs the Young Men's Ultimate Weekend, and so I think you'll find a, an extraordinary opportunity coming up in just a, a week from Friday or October 26th to 28th. Great, great. The Boy Crisis, wonderful book. Pick it up, read it, listen to it. Uh, go to MarsVenus.com, learn more about Dr. Gray, his extensive and impressive background, as well as Dr. Farrell, WarrenFarrell.com, right? Yes. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for all your insight, and you'll get a ton more by going through the book. Anyone listening to this can't recommend it enough. So that's it. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Empower Humans. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review this podcast. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit EmpowerHumans.com. We'll catch you next time.